Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Chris Bennett of Bop Works Drumsticks. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Bart. Yeah, I'm uh, honored to have you here. I, I want to do more drumstick episodes for sure. I've only done a few, whereas, you know, you there's tons of snare drum and drum set episodes, um, and I've gotten a lot of requests for them. And this actually episode is um, a request by a great friend of the show, Mr. Terry Klein, who had nothing but good things to say about your sticks and um, the handwritten note he gets from you guys with the sticks. And uh, it's just cool to have a, you know, get a direct referral from a fan of the show. We include uh, $20 bills to people that we think are going to, you know, give us a good, good mention on the website. Good. Okay. I'm sure you're going to yeah. get a lot of orders now. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. So, Chris, you make reproductions of the signature sticks of some of the most legendary players like Art Blakey, Mel Lewis. Formerly, you've done ones for like Gene Krupa, Shelly Mann. Tell us about this. What's the story behind making these signature sticks? Then we'll get into each individual, you know, what makes each one unique. But what's what's the story with it? Uh, sure. Well, just a brief uh, comment. I, I love the big fat snare drum stuff. I just wanted to shout out to those guys. Yeah. Cause it's a cool product. Um, what were we talking about? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So I was in music retail for a long time and people would bring stuff in on consignment. A lot of times there'd be older drums and this was back in the before time before we're, we're doing internet. So your only contact with people would be like the not so modern drummer newsletter that was published by John, who did John Aldridge, excuse me, mm -hmm. who did a great service. So I would just collect these sticks and go, oh, cool. These are old sticks. And I just put them in a box. And then I had some help from some of my drummer friends who, you know, be on the road and they'd pick up some sticks that. They thought were cool and bring them back. So it was kind of a, a backdoor thing. And I just hmm. held on to them for a long time. I'm not sure if that's answering your question totally, but that's initially yeah. it. Um, and then the story, I'm going to do a cartoon of this. So the, the story is in like 2005, <laughs> I was playing a gig at the Elephant Room, which is the sort of the premier jazz club in Austin and I had just bought um a Zuljan a K was it even a K? It was uh one that Bill Stewart was using. It was K Complex Dry Ride. There were two editions. I got the first one. So I was all excited and it's like, okay, I'm taking taking this to the gig. And I took it down and set it up and started playing it. And it was like the only thing I can describe it would be like it was akin to like geese honking or something. It was like completely out of control. I couldn't play it. So I couldn't get a good sound to save my life. But it, it did annoy the guitar player. So hmm. it wasn't totally lost. Um, <laughs> That's good. So, I, you know, I was disillusioned. And every drummer who's kind of into this is going to know the search for the ideal ride symbol usually the tony williams yep. you know famous four and more k so i'm thinking you know and bill stewart's phenomenal so i just thought yeah i'm gonna play this symbol and then i'll move to new york and i'll i'll get bill's gigs <laughs> yeah that's how right? it works uh, and that <laughs> didn't quite happen so anyway i i went home the next day and uh actually i went home that night the next day i just sat there going, I don't understand this. So I went to my little box of drumsticks and I pulled out a pair of Ludwig Roy Haynes models from the 60s. And back in the day, drummers would call those pencil sticks for mm -hmm. obvious reason. So then I, I set up the, the K again and I played it. And it was like, you know, this choir of angels opens, opens up and I, <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's the deal. 
except for Bill, who of course could play on anything with, you know, any stick. But it occurred to me then that the smaller sticks were being made. These guys could have any stick they want made and any size, any length. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a big deal. So I played the Roy Haynes and then I found a couple other sticks that were sort of similar. And it was like, okay, so now we're in the 50s and the 60s. We got these guys playing in jazz clubs, which were acoustically, you know, were in basements or, yeah. you know, um, so the reason would be you had a lighter cymbal and the cymbals back then, as, as drummers will know, were usually th- pretty thin and had a lot of wash because they just mm-hmm. haven't, hadn't evolved, you know, and Zildjian and the K's uh, were just kind of sticking with this uniform thinness. There was no heavy medium. Sure. Right. So it, it made sense because then you're playing with a lighter stick and you can pull more sounds out of the, the cymbal instead of the wash that you would get with a heavier stick. Hmm. That being said, there were certainly guys that were using like 5A style yeah. sticks, but it would really depend on the gig and, and if you're playing with a trio or a big band. So that's kind of how that, that of began, I guess. What's amazing to me before you go on is just that um, that importance of the drum stick to the sound of something. It's kind of like someone's drum sound is usually made up of like the stick, the head choice, even the rim choice. It's just not like buy cymbals, buy drums, buy sticks, you're good to go. I mean, you kind of you learn that the more and you you were obviously a seasoned drummer at that point and you were sort of learning that it's pretty fascinating that that the the amount of uh detail of each little thing affects to get those signature sounds of guys like the amazing like Bill Stewart um sure it's pretty cool so yeah kick carry on well that's basically the idea it's you know and Bill's kind of like a 7a so I just started going through the six and what I realized and what you said is of paramount importance, which is, you know, and I've, I've been guilty of this as well. You go into the drum shop and you grab a test stick out of the bucket and you just mm-hmm. go and you play all the rides and you go, ah, this one's kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. I'll play this one. Okay. I'm going to buy this one. You buy the symbol and you, you take it home and while you're driving home, somehow the molecular molecular structure of the symbol changes and you get it either to the gig or at home and you play it with your sticks and it sounds nothing like yeah. what you thought you were buying. So what that does is it puts drummers on a continual quest to get that riot symbol sound that we all love, you know, the Tony yep. uh, foreign more. So it's a vital importance because if you're changing your symbols, you're thinking getting rid of them, then it may not be the symbol, right? And you, mm-hmm. as you, as you mentioned, it's basically an extension of your your hand, right? And you're so you're just using a a, a connective object, right? And then a lot of that has to come with your your technique and how you pull the sound out of the symbols. But you know, just the historic thing really got me intrigued because yeah. we all love these drummers and it's sort of like, well, we knew that they played this drum set or this drum set or this drum set, but you're playing jazz, you're playing the rod cymbal a lot of the time or the hi hats. So hmm. that's kind of how it came to fruition. If you will. Well, that's, I mean, that's fascinating because it's just uh, another uh, element of the world that we're in where it's like, yeah, it's the, you could even go, it's just funny. Cause like they have so many details to them. It could be like, you know, they're what shoes they're wearing to play their bass drum pedal. Are they barefoot? Are they wearing wingtips? It's just all these little things affect um, everything, which is just fascinating. So it's cool. You kind of found like a little uh, corner to kind of, um, you know, get in and do something really special. 
So what I would love to learn more about is maybe we go down through the signature sticks that you've made Mm -hmm. and um, talk about the process of recreating them, including who, what was the brand that originally made them? I mean, you can start with whoever, but I've got Art Blakey first on my list. Um, Okay. How did, how did you do it? Well, the, let let me, first of all, preface this by saying, since we're a small company, a lot of the other stick makers as well, we use OEM manufacturers because to actually buy the tooling and the lathes. Sure. You're talking... So this, the sticks are made to our specs by initially smaller wood shops that turned out sticks for like Silver Fox and mm-hmm. their Scorpion drumsticks. Uh, Danny Anderson uh, makes a wonderful heavier stick. He has those made by Promark, and we've just switched over to Promark. Oh, cool. So when you'll basically send the stick or you'll send the specs and they'll run some test models, send them back to you and you kind of go that way. So jumping back to your Art Blakey question, his primary association would have been with Gretsch probably through the early fifties. I'm guessing maybe a little later um, until probably the late seventies. So what we did is is take the the Gretsch sticks of Art Blakey's, and they they were somewhat inconsistent. Let's mm-hmm. let's kind of. So what we did, right. as well as the Mel Lewis, we take the sticks, five or six sticks, do the micrometer stuff and the taper, and how long the tip was, tip to shoulder, how the back was shaped. Uh, most sticks now are rounded and uh, in the back, but uh, some of the older sticks would be just kind of cut off hmm. with kind of a square end. So we we would all just try and duplicate that exactly. And there's your stick. Yes, so, that's interesting. So that was actually our first signature stick. Uh, one of our sons, uh, Takashi Blakey, who's a lawyer in New York City, has the Art Blakey Foundation. Very cool guy. Gave us, you know, the authorization to go ahead and do that. Hmm. So yeah, that's yeah. how you find interesting stories that normally don't make it, you know, to print or, you know, there's a lot of stuff floating around out there. People are playing arts drum sets and his symbols without even knowing it. <laughs> That's cool. A lot of, uh, he had a rather large family, and some of them got a hold of his drums after he passed and, you know, like pawned them. Hmm. So wow. that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. So that's Takashi told me that. So wow. it's just kind of interesting because every drummer wonders what happened to the stuff, you know? Yeah. I've had some episode kind of suggestions about that. What happened to, you know, X and Y drummers gear after they passed away? And it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things where it's, who do I talk to about that? If, cause if I could find that person, then that would kind of answer the question for everyone. I think a lot of people are looking and I can't even remember the drummer. Maybe it was like Keith moon or one of these people where I'm sure they're in museums and stuff. But, mm-hmm. um, so anyway, that that's fascinating. And I know we'll probably talk about it more later with the, you know, discontinued sticks that you're no longer making. But uh, it's it's interesting to me about how you need to go the proper avenues and talk with the estate of the drummers, Um, because if you don't, then that's just not right. And that's, you know, uh, that's forgery. I guess that's not the right word. That's using their, you know, dead relatives name to make money, which obviously you're not trying to do. So, um, yeah. Now, um, what can you describe Art Blakey's stick a little bit for us? I think you you did a little bit, but was it a uh, what? How would you describe it size wise, type of wood, all that stuff? These are all hickory, which was sort of the the common Mm -hmm. wood. I think that you know it was plentiful, and they would use second growth hickory. And Art Stick is just kind of a normal looking drumstick. Uh, The tip is kind of 
a little bit triangular. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anybody wants to look at the sticks, you know, they can just do a model comparison. And I, I will mention also that our Facebook page, the Bob Burks page, I've uploaded a ton of vintage ads and vintage articles cool. just for, you know, drum history nerds because yeah. now thanks to the modern communications, uh, we, we know that there are a lot of them out there. So yeah. arts would be like a 5A. Um, yeah, there's one. And as far as I can tell, well, the maker's, who they used to manufacture their sticks. Again, um, Gretsch used Capella, which is a, mm-hmm. a company in New Jersey, to do a lot of their sticks in the 50s and 60s. That doesn't mean there weren't other people making them. Sure. Right? So it's, it's kind of fuzzy. So if we yeah. were to take the... Uh, sticks. You uh, oftentimes you'd get the R. Blakey sticks. They would come in little plastic bags, which is actually what ours do. We just trying to replicate that. So they come in plastic bags, and you can look at at the ones that we haven't opened, and you can see that there's a difference in length. There may be like a sixteenth uh, of an inch difference. There might the tip might be slightly different. Um, all those things which would drive everyone crazy nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> it was just sort of standard for a lot of the companies. And and yeah. aside from that would be Fred and Dinah Gretsch. I don't know if it's Diana or Dinah Gretsch. I think it's Dinah. Dinah. We're at a NAM show here in Austin and they had a Q&A with those two. And so we went into the little, you know, kind of lecture room and there were surprisingly few people there. And I was able at least to raise my hand and go, uh, something along these lines of, oh, Mr. Gretsch, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm really interested in your, uh, drumsticks, um, manufacturing and sourcing from say the fifties to the sixties. And Fred goes, well, that's a that's a interesting question. That's something I was very involved in, hmm. uh, and we had a hard time getting wood. Long pause, <laughs> and that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's all <laughs> so, you get. Yeah, and so I, I saw the Gretsch rep the next day, and he goes, "Yeah, you probably didn't get all you needed out of that." Um, so that's kind of, we don't really know who was manufacturing their sticks at what time period, but yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I think it's just kind of a neat, uh, you know, look in that time frame when, um, the company like Art Blakey is obviously very famously a Gretsch player. Um, and it just kind of made sense that he would play Gretsch drum sticks. Whereas nowadays it's almost like. That doesn't happen. It's like everyone, obviously, it, there's the Pro Marks and the Vic Firths, and there's the big player, the big stick companies that a lot of people play, but it's kind of been like segmented more where, you know, um, obviously Zildjian still makes sticks, but they're with Vic Firth and stuff. But um, yes. you know what I mean, though, where like, yeah, yeah, like I'm playing Vic, it, it almost seemed like an afterthought of like, I don't, whatever, just give me the sticks. Gretsch makes them great. I'll play them. Cool. They're not totally consistent. Well, it is what it is. I guess it was just a, a sign of the times of like less computer perfect things, but it's just neat that it was all, you're kind of all in one. Well, cause even Gretsch would sell symbols and things like that. Cause I guess Gretsch had some Zildjian connections with the, there was lawsuits there, but um, it's just a different, it's a different era for sure. They did. Uh, Gretsch handled the K. Mm-hmm line at that time and you know i'm i'm pretty much telling history that everybody knows but i'm trying to eat up time on this podcast too (laughs) not everyone knows it i I always say on the show don't take it for granted there's a lot of young drummers um or you know early drummers where you know that's and hey i like rehearing things that i already know so go for it (laughs) well so 
in the the old days, right? And so a lot of us came up in you know baby boomers, uh, 60s, 70s. And if you were living in a small town or a smaller, you know, rural area, and were lucky n- enough to have a music store, then they'd have like a you know maybe a two foot by four foot stick display, and depending on what they had in there, whether it was a Slingerland or uh, Capella or Ludwig, you basically would just go in there and go, yeah, these look kind of cool, and you just buy the sticks. And if you're an experienced drummer and you were like hip, you would at least roll them on the counter. Yep. Uh, but I never, I didn't learn that for 10 years. So it was just kind of, yeah, these are work. I like these. Co- oh, I haven't tried these. I'll try these. Oh, Dino Danelli for, with the Rascals. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Or you buy a cymbal and you just go and, oh, oh, I need a crash run. There's one. Okay, I'll buy that. Yeah. So it wasn't as big a deal. Um, I know the the pros in you know New York and LA. Everybody was kind of ahead on that, but it still wasn't a big deal, and no one really cared what sticks those yeah. you know the greats played because they were all more interested in the the cymbals and and the drums. So it was just kind of like, eh, yeah, you need sticks to play those, and I, I think the importance of that kind of came to the fore when you got guys like Vic Firth or Promark was way uh, before Vic. I think they were early 60s, I'm guessing. I've done an episode on Vic Firth. Uh, there isn't one on Promark yet, and Vader I'll do, but um, yeah, refer to that. People can refer to that episode. I kind of forget the exact timeline, but um, you know, that's just interesting. It's like I feel like we've become more and more detail focused over time, which is good, but there's something kind of like uh, nice. I don't know if that's the right word or like um, uh, like um, nostalgic about just kind of like, yeah, give me sticks, whatever. And like a guy, his snare is sitting on like a chair because he didn't have a snare stand and he's just got to do it. There's an old picture of my grandpa playing where like I like a couple pictures where he didn't have a hi hat stand. It was like 1957. Mm hmm. And his bass drum had a cinder block in front of it. And um, it was just like, and there was a guy playing a clarinet. And I'm yeah. thinking like, boy, that, uh, that, you know, I hope it sounded good, but just a clarinet and a bass drum and a snare. It's like, <laughs> I don't know about, uh, about that, but it's like, it's just fun. Um, it's just cool to see the evolution, you know, about not caring so much about every little detail, every little thing. It's just a different uh, era. That's kind of very nostalgic. Well, and a lot of those guys, you can find pictures of them, like the Joe Jones uh, springs to mind. Right as he was joining, or right before he joined Basie, a lot of those guys were just playing these ratty drum sets, you know? And it it's... Yeah. So then it has nothing to do with what the guy's playing. Then it's it all comes back to your touch. And we all know... Joe Jones was kind of the master of the hi hat. Sure. And so it's just kind of interesting. Alan Dawson, in an interview, uh, Scott K. Fish, who used to write for Modern Drummer and has a little kind of website that you might want to check out. He's got interviews that he did. He was talking with Alan Dawson, and the first question he asked him was, so, you know, when you're coming up, you know, did you guys like pay attention to symbols or, you know, if you were into Joe Jones, did you want to get a drum set like him or, and, you know, Dawson just goes, no, <laughs> none of us cared about that stuff. We were more interested in the sound. We yeah. wanted to get that sound. We didn't really go to the the brand name and the, the symbol or drums because these guys were getting an amazing sound and that's what they wanted to get. And so as opposed to drum thinking drums or cymbals will give you the sound. Mm -hmm. If that, if that makes sense, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's, it's uh, plus there's no internet. There's no, um, you know, you would be listening to the radio. You'd be looking at like, downbeat magazine and that's how you'd get these pictures but it's obviously different than now where it's like oh what was uh art blakey playing you know 
type, type, type. Oh, there it is. Cool. Let me try and, you know, I can, you can now get that <laughs> same kind of drum set, that vintage drum set and have it delivered. You know, I'm sure it's expensive and it's vintage obviously, but um, mm-hmm. it's just different, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. And uh, let's jump over quickly just to, cause I want to talk about Mel Lewis a little bit, and then we'll go to your older kind of models, Gene and Shelly, um, mm-hmm. who were both, you know, just icons in the drumming world. So I'm interested in that too. But um, how did you get them? I, I know there's the estate and all that stuff. How did it work with Mel Lewis? The same thing. Uh, Mel's wife, Doris Sokoloff, had two daughters. So we kind of moved through them and got the, you know, the estate. And of course, when things are working correctly and when we have <laughs> enough six, uh, then there's a, a licensing fee. So they get a portion mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of the fee. Uh, Shelly Mann's wife, Flip, who I think is like 99. Wow. Uh, and is still dancing. She sent me a couple of Shelly sticks. Uh, I think one was a pearl. So we just took one of those and did it. Um, but her request was that all the proceeds go to the LA Jazz. I'm going to get this wrong. LA Jazz Foundation, which nice up and coming. Yeah. So there have been a few glitches where we've been down, uh, produ- down production wise, and have kind of had to close shop uh, in the late 2000s. So some of that stuff gets pulled around and sometimes these people move, et cetera, et cetera. But sure. they seem all, you know, willing to answer whatever questions like uh, Takashi Blakey. Yeah. If you, the uh, Hollywood drum shop, pro percussion, you know, Bob Yeager's guys that are working there now, they'll tell you pretty much anything you want to know about that because they've been there since the 60s so yeah you know even you know the rock guys Procaro and keltner everybody would come in and hang you know because that's how you got your information and you know hey man did you check these out and right so drum yeah. s- drum shops were like little communities and uh it was kind of a cool thing I wanted to ask you too before we move on because I've never heard this term and it's probably something where everyone's going. This is obvious; we all know this, but I've never heard it. You said before second growth hickory. What is second growth? When hickory is harvested and it grows back, they're calling that second growth, which is kind of confusing. Hmm. Uh, it's like the the tree has or the wood is mutated or something. So it's kind of a um, standard practice. Is it stronger or is yeah. it what it what okay it is. Yeah. Basically, they just think it it holds up better. And so they it's regrown after a timber harvest. Hmm. And then they wait a lot uh for the next batch of trees to come to fruition. And hmm. that's basically so, it. Yeah. So it's just more mature. Like it's yeah. it's Second round. Okay, that's cool. I, I, I've never heard of that term. Um, now you know as much as I do. Let's move forward here and talk about the man that most people love, Gene Krupa. How did that go down? Um, I know you mentioned before we were recording that um, you did make them, and then there were some estate things, which I know goes back and forth with all these guys. Um, what's the story with Gene and his stick? His second wife was... I think Pat basically controlled the estate, so it had to go through her. Um, the the Slingerland sticks that we're going after were the ones from the '40s because that's one of the more popular uh, periods for him. Mm-hmm. And the thing was when we when Bopworks went down uh, late 2000s, I think I mentioned. Uh, we just kind of lost uh, the connection, and I wasn't really going to go through that again. So, um, our '40s swing classic is the exact 
same thing. It's it's the Krupa stick. We just gotcha. had to call it 4D swing because it was, I don't know, hopefully people would make that, that connection, I guess. Yeah, but well, that's a little bit of an insider scoop here where, you know, if you want the Krupa stick, that's what it is. Um, and that's uh, what, what would you describe that stick as like lengthwise, size, uh, you know, the tip and all that stuff? They were basically almost like five A's ish. They're about maybe 16 inches long. So they're actually just kind of your standard drumstick. It's, it's interesting how little things have changed in regard to that. Um, Can I ask you like a chicken versus the egg kind of question? Did was he one of the guys who kind of pioneered in making it a standard drumstick or at that point, was it already kind of like the five, a 16 inches? Was that already kind of a standard or did it, did it become a standard after guys like him were using it? I think if no, I don't think, I think prior to that, I mean, we're looking all the way back into, uh, you know, a hundred years ago when mm-hmm. right around when the, the talky pictures came in. And if you go back and you look at some of the earlier catalogs, or I think a lot of his, drum history buffs have copies or archives of that stuff. You can, you can pretty much see in the twenties and thirties, it's just kind of the same concept. Mm-hmm. And so there wasn't a huge difference in the Krupa thing. It's just, it had a triangle tip, um, 16 inches long. 0.515 in diameter, a little bit over, you know, half an inch, more like a 7A. And it it astounded me that, and a lot of these guys, as you know, were playing calfskin heads, which are not as bouncy if you're in a, a humid, mm-hmm. uh, a humid gig. So they don't have microphones, and they're playing with calfskin heads. And they're using these sticks. So it kind of begs the question, you know, what kind of technique were these guys all using? Or not technique per se, but it it would make you play differently. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us would agree if you had sticks like that and we're having to kick a big band, um, that wouldn't be common. There, There are a lot of great drummers in the world right now who could do that. But it's just an interesting, interesting point. Cause he, he'd have to be kicking it. Mel Lewis would be the same way. He'd be playing in a big band, but he wouldn't be overpowering. He would just kind of support what was going on. Shelly man, the same thing. His, his stick was very, very close to hmm. the Birdland, which I guess I should also mention. So the Birdland is the Ludwig, Roy Haynes model. That's the one we started with. Yeah, the pencil kind of thinner. Yeah. And so I had a hundred of those made at this wood shop in Maine. Um, and when Vic started, he was using that wood shop until he got going enough to kind of build his own setup. But that was it. I had a hundred made, passed them out to some friends. And the reception was good. So that's kind of, that precipitated the other models being added. So it it Hmm. took a while. Yeah, I'm sure. What's your favorite stick that you've, out of these signature sticks that you've played, or maybe one that you haven't done? And maybe that's a good transition to, um, the world has been insane. I mean, it's 2021 right now. So everything's been nuts. But in the future, you know, two part question, what's your favorite stick of any signature vintage stick that you've found kind of in your collecting. And then do you plan on adding more down the road? What can people look forward to, you know, in the future? We do plan on adding more. Now, in terms of the actual vintage uh, signature sticks, we'll see. Uh, We want to bring the Shelly back. And two of our models are actually contemporary. So we've got one called a Memphis R&B, which is slightly larger diameter, still 16 inches long. Um, 
and that's got a, a tip to shoulder uh, ratio, a little thicker, and it bears a striking resemblance to the Ludwig stick. And again, a lot of drummers will know this stick from the old days. Uh, and then he, the initials uh, are BR. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, okay. So we got as close to that as we could. Then we've got another one called the Rhythm and Grooves, which has a slightly larger diameter, more like a 5B, but it's got a super long taper. So that gives you the feeling of having some heft you know, on the body of the stick, but then the taper enables you to, to not wash out the cymbal. So that came from a Leedy model, uh, probably from the 40s. Interesting. So is it fair to say that every major drum manufacturer back in the day, your Leedy, Rogers, Gretsch, Ludwig, Slingerland, and on and on, they would sell their own drumsticks? Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. That's actually a great question. Um, I think at the time, well, I know for a fact that most of those companies were making their own. So what happened when Promark came in to the picture, a lot of these companies went, well, hell, they're making sticks and it's cheaper than having the employees do them, paying them and running the lays and all the expense where if you can get Promark to make them, you've cut down, number one, the expenses, and you have a company that really cares about the, the quality of the sticks. So there are some, I can't pinpoint the transition, but that's basically what happened there. Hmm. That was explained to me by Tom Osborne, who is the brother of Donnie Osborne, a big band player. And Tom worked at the Slingerland factory hmm. probably for 10 years during that time. So he was there when Buddy came in. And um, and that was basically what he told me. He, he just said, you know, it was it was way cheaper. You know, and Capella, uh, Capella I don't know. Uh, Collado may have been doing some of that. So I think Ludwig, you can always see pictures of their factory uh, yep. with a drumstick. So I think it kind of evolved into a, a cost ratio and the accountants were going, you know, let's, let's get these from somewhere else and not, you know, have to pay these guys and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but it makes sense to offer them. I mean, I feel like in those days you look at the catalogs, like the old Gretsch catalog or anything. I mean, they offered everything. Like it would be like, you know, whatever. We'll give you, you know, we have cymbal stands. We have cymbals. We have drums. We have heads. You want a whistle? We'll sell you a whistle. Yes. <laughs> like we'll give you anything and everything you want. Just buy it through us. And I know that it, there's a lot of like, like Wahlberg and Ajé, like these companies who would really make the stuff. Um, yes. Which, hey, that still happens today. I mean, there's still the OEM kind of like, like it's it's happening with you where you're, but you're turning it and you know making it your own product and and i know it's similar with keller shells where people say oh keller but it, it comes up a fair amount on the show where it's like well people order their special recipe from keller doesn't mean you're getting the off-the-shelf stuff that we can all buy on um you know their website um it's just how the world works so uh it's um, it's it's neat to know that that happened so long ago uh it just makes financial and logistical uh sense yeah and if you're if you're looking at uh, a lot of those catalogs the sticks were offered but it wasn't a big deal it's like you know okay we have these we have these marching sticks you know we have these orchestra sticks eventually they started 50s probably started calling them dance models mm -hmm. right? um so i think <laughs> That's fair to say there is, they were an item, you know, as part of their line, but that doesn't mean drummers were always playing them. Yeah. Um, I can give you a quick, interesting thing there. Um, sure. so first of all, you, you got to give, you know, kudos to Rob Cook, because I think without Rob and his great books, we wouldn't have had, you know, a, a fraction of this information. So sure. if anybody wants to, you know really get down and look at the 
I don't know. Do you get down reading books? I'm not sure. <laughs> With but Rob's books, you get down you, reading them, right? <laughs> you do. And he's reprinted the leady newsletter. Yeah. Uh, the topics. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and he's, he really cares about that stuff. So anyway, the, the side story to that, the Keller thing, um, there's a lot of stuff going online where there's, there's Jasper shells being like the hot thing and mm-hmm. better than. So the quick story to that is Gretsch made their own drum shells until the early fifties, the three ply ones. And then they went to Jasper in Indiana to do that. When Tommy Robertson of Tommy's drum shop here in Austin bought the fives name he went up to jasper to go look at the molds and talk about you know buying the molds so he would continue and the molds were so in such bad shape because they've been used for decades jasper had them like propped up on uh cinder blocks you know because they were so funky and so he couldn't use them so he actually had to have shell molds made for the fives, which would be enormously expensive, but the formula is the same. You know, the tolerances are exactly the same, hmm. the ply direction. So, you know, I just offer a cautionary tale there because you put them side by side, tune them up the same. It's, it's really not, you yeah. know. So anyway, that's, that's a little aside there. No, I can, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I've talked to Tommy before, and then it sort of got put on the back burner, and we're going to have him on to do a Fives episode. But there's certain brands where people are very, very, very passionate, and um, Fives is one of them. And um, as we get close to the end here, why don't we talk about you a little bit more? You're a pretty uh, innovative guy with some. We, we, when we first met, you were showing me some products. And things you're working on. Uh, what other cool stuff outside of drumsticks uh, have you been working on? And uh, anything else you want to share with the listeners? We've got a couple um, stick. I'm, I'm trying to do this subtly. Stick holder things that we're we're prototyping, or we actually have the prototypes. And the next thing we're going to have to do is go to uh, crowdfunding to get them. Mm-hmm. Uh, into production, but I'm pretty excited about it. I wish I could kind of reveal more, but it's, I think drummers are really going to like them. And that simply comes from, you know, playing a lot and experiencing certain things when you're playing that everybody experiences and, you know, losing your drumsticks or, you know, trying to get in your stick bag, you know, yeah. on a dark stage and you can't figure out what stick so it kind of addresses that so anyway that's what we're going to do prior to adding more sticks or other types of sticks but yeah there and there are stick designs from the before time where you can see some interesting ideas leady had one called the super balance where the actual back of the it would taper in the back as well slightly, which would make the stick balance in the center, so you're kind of automatically getting a fulcrum there. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's neat. Yeah, so we're kind of thinking there. I've had a lot of guys, uh, drummers in Austin, you know, come up when we'd hang and they'd play the sticks and go, "This is really cool, man. You should do this." And so we'll see. But yeah, basically, I, you know, I want to make sure that people are contacting the other guys because the last thing I want to do is paint myself in authority, all the Rob Cook, and I'm just a drumstick nerd. And at the time there wasn't, this wasn't happening because the, the market was geared towards rock stuff. Yeah. And they weren't really... You know, they they weren't the drummers. You know, they had the Peter Erskine, Bill Stewart things. But those guys aren't necessarily playing in, you know, really bad rooms or tiled hotel lobbies. And yeah, for sure. Yeah. And 
I, I love getting guys like you on the show with a different voice because Rob has been on the show probably more than anyone else. And he's coming back on at some point soon to do another episode. But, you know, it can't be 100 episodes of me talking to Rob as much as I would like that. <laughs> so it's good to get other voices. And I really love how you started out the episode talking about uh, just like the importance of like, man, the symbol doesn't sound great. And then you try with a different stick and then boom, it sounds good. It's like I've also had it where like. I didn't like a symbol, like like you said, it sounded great at the music store. I got home, I didn't like it, but like maybe my ear changed a little bit, or I kind of changed, like I lightened up a little bit, or I used a nylon tip or something, and like you sort of evolve into it to try. I mean, and then sometimes you just return the symbol because it's not working out if you can. Mm-hmm. But um, it's it's neat, just how it's like. I mean, it's it's an alloy. It's like a a living evolving thing um so it's neat to just kind of think about that and the importance of that and i don't take for granted that maybe maybe people don't realize that that like oh yeah maybe the symbol i i have maybe i should be using lighter sticks or heavier sticks Mm -hmm. um so that's a great takeaway for a lot of you know a, a practical takeaway to try different sticks on your symbols and i think a lot of drummers are hip to the fact that you know i better bring my stick in and and Mm -hmm. make sure so true it's just a word of advice and so the last thing i wanted to say history wise is there's a website called uh drum archive oh my god absolutely love it it is yeah amazing yeah so there's your there's answers to all your questions in terms of getting in catalogs and you know you know double kudos to those guys because you don't have to pay two hundred dollars for a you know, 66 Gretsch catalog like you did in the eighties, you know, it's, it's, yeah, for sure. And, and I should know their names. I know people who know, like, I'm sure people we all know, uh, of the drum nerd guys, I'm sure someone's screaming their name and I, and I cannot remember the, the actual drum archive guys names. And I, uh, wish I could, but I, um, it's drumarchive.com, And as Chris said, it's just like, I mean, I'm looking at it now. It's Ajax to Zildjian uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and everything in between. And it's got just catalogs and pricing sheets and British drums and Japanese and it's everything. So that's a great suggestion for everyone. So and I, I if, if people have seen on social media where I post like an old catalog, it's without a doubt from from there. Yeah, um, and it's yeah, it's uh, really good resources and. Can I can I mention one other thing that was interesting, which was I thanks to Robin Flans, who was a writer for uh, Modern Drummer, um, and she actually just put out the book about Jeff Picaro. So I basically kind of messaged her on Facebook and asked if she knew how to get a hold of Bobby Columby, um, who of course we know played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And a lot of drummers love the guy. Sure. And he just downplayed his abilities to the fact that, you know, when I first read the interview, it was like that she did in 82. I was like, what? I was outraged. So I, he was kind enough to spend like two and a half hours on the phone with me, ask, you know, answering my nerd questions. And one of the things he said, which kind of tallies with my statement about not caring what you played was a the the drums that he played on all the bs and t albums mainly were were rogers so he was endorsing fives and then premiere then slingerland but for some reason he kept using the fives which are now in mark knopfler's studio i think in england but anyway so i said so bobby when you were like recording the second album you know spinning wheel and all that stuff I already know the answer to this, but I got to ask it. He said, did you, you know, did you like change drum heads to record and stuff like that? And he goes, hell no. It was like, no, I, we'd go out and play a gig and then we'd set them up and, we, you know, so, but everybody loves his drum sound. Yeah. Right. So it's just yeah. interesting. You, you talk to the guys that were doing that stuff. Um, yeah. And man, he's got some stories. So 
Yeah, well, I found too that like you you hear about you know there was an episode on Ringo and it'd be like he's not a gear guy whatsoever. No. He's just, it's just like they don't care as much. They just play the drums, and it's just an interesting uh, dichotomy, I guess you could say, of like you know you don't need to be obsessed with gear and be uh, fine tuning everything. Obviously, he has you know they have drum techs and all that, but um, it's just you know there's it takes all kinds. It's almost kind of I'm sure it kind of drives the the gear nut ultra tune everything all the time guys and girls a little nuts to be like but i'm so much more uh you know anal about this stuff but he's doing fine and he's just hitting things <laughs> you know it's like but what do you do it's all just the passion of of playing and all that stuff um it takes all kinds it does and i think we're all subject to you know way more marketing now and sure I think probably, you know, so some of that's just kind of inherent and, you know, I'm as nerdy as everybody else when it comes to stuff like that, even though I know better, it's still kind of fun. So oh, it is. That's why we're here. Yeah, exactly. Um, You're doing a great thing, incidentally. Uh, oh, well, thank you. These podcasts and you have a great voice, Bart, if I, I, I've never told you that, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, um, I did when I was freelancing doing video and audio between kind of jobs, it would be like, I would do voiceovers uh, for like friends doing videos. And it was like good, easy money. But man, that's a hard, once you get in, once you get into the voiceover world, it's, um, it's good, but it's hard to get in. Um, and I work at a studio where I record a ton of voiceovers, but it's, uh, they call it mailbox money, where if you get a good gig, like being the voice of like something like, uh, Fifth Third Bank, which is here, which is I work on their spots. It's like w of another voiceover talent, but it's like they just, you know, it airs. They mail you a check mailbox money. Um, but anyway, I appreciate it. Um, so, Chris, why don't we tell people now where they can find you and we'll wrap this up. And then uh, Chris has been kind enough to join me for a little bonus episode, which uh, I hope you're still OK with it. I want to hear a little bit about uh, there was kind of a story of doing the Buddy Rich drumsticks and it was kind of a little bit of a not controversial thing, but but like it's just a bit of a story. Um, so if you're still willing to hang out and share that story, that would be great. Um, sure. OK, so, uh, yeah, why don't you tell people where they can find you a good email, social media, and then we'll hop over and and get some buddy talk for the Patreon bonus episode. Very cool. Okay. So they can find us, of course, at the www.bopworks.net. Uh, we do have a Facebook page, which I mentioned has in the photo section has like a billion uh, vintage ads, some of which are, are really cool, some of which are, are funny. And there's some articles. Um, cool. So, you know, even if you were to, never to buy a Bopworks drumstick, you still get a real kick out of just going through those, those photos. Yeah. And, uh, so if anybody wants to just shoot us an email, that's info at bopworks.net. Uh, the biggest thing I get is people going, can you make a stick exactly like something or I need it to these specs. Hmm. And what I do to save, save them time. There's, uh, in Louisiana, there's, a drum shop called L.A. Backbeat. And my good friend, Frank Kinsell. Yes. And Frank makes great drumsticks. Um, and actually, I play some of his on gigs that I'm playing a little louder. But if anybody's looking to do a custom thing, Frank is the guy to, you know, shoot an email. He's, uh, yeah, and he's knowledgeable. He can tell you anything you want to know about wood. Hmm. So yeah. that's yeah. That. We'll have to talk. We'll have to get him on the show later. I always see him at the drum shows um, and stuff, and, and just a super nice guy. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad you gave him a, a mention. Um, so uh, yeah, everyone, it's Bop Works B O P W R K S dot net. Chris, thanks for joining me here today, and everyone else, if you want to join the Patreon, um, you can go to the drumhistorypodcast.com, dot com. Click the link. Uh, pay any amount of money. I think it's two bucks is the lowest and you get these bonus episodes um, such as what I'm about to do with 
Chris talking about Mr. Buddy Rich and the drama that came from trying to get a signature stick made. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Chris, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.